Good morning, Hills Bible Church. Could you please turn to the book of Jude? The book of Jude, and we will read from verse 5 through to 10. The book of Jude, verse 5 through to 10. And the Bible says, Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe, and the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Yet in like manner, these people also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority and blaspheme the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Let us commit this time to the Lord in prayer. Lord, our mighty God, you have spoken through your servant Jude to a church then, and you speak through your person, Jude, to the church now. And Lord, I pray that we would open our hearts to the message that you have for your people this day. I pray that my words might be in line with the truth of Scripture. May you test our hearts and see if there's anything in us that needs to reconform in to the image of Christ. Help us, Lord, we pray. May your grace be upon us as we deal with this text. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, quite often I will ask my girls, can God do anything he likes? And my girls, knowing enough of theology now or enough of God, says, yes, God can do anything he likes except things that go against his own nature. Now, embedded in that truth is the immutability of God. That is the understanding that God does not change. And in fact, that is the foundational understanding of all God's attributes, that God's attributes do not change for God does not change. And this is very good news for the Christian. And it is because of this that the writers in the scriptures tell us to look back, look back on the God of the past, Look back how he dealt with the things of the past, with the sins and obedience, because they are predictors of how God will deal with his people now. Wouldn't it be strange if God could change? That if God did lie, how could we look at scripture now and believe it or trust in the Lord of the future? No, our whole eternity would be held in the balance under a capricious God who would make up his mind at whim. No, our God does not change. And the word tells us to look back upon the things that God has done in the past for they will predict the future. Oh, looking back so often in our, I think, 21st century thinking, to look back is a step backwards. Yeah, we have progressed haven't we? Uh, technologically, um, intellectually, uh, things then are different to things now. The way God dealt with people, surely he wouldn't deal with them now like that. Oh no, we've got to understand, brothers and sisters, that God does not change. Oh indeed, he, he dealt with Israel in a certain way that he wouldn't deal with, deal with us necessarily. But at the same time, the underpinnings of God's unchanging nature and his judgments certainly do carry forth. Oh, this is wonderful news for the righteous, the one who believes in, in the Lord Jesus Christ, who walks in the ways of God, because they 
can hold on to the promises of God, to trust them, knowing that they will come to pass. But how hard is this for a rebellious person? For this is a warning. For the one who judged sin then will also judge sin now and judge sin in the future. Oh no, if you spurn the grace of God now, you can be assured that judgment will come, for God does not change. God comes with blessing and God comes with cursing. And it's this understanding of God and his nature and the predictions of what has happened to what will come is what underpins Jude's statements here that I've just read for you now. Jude 5 to 10. These, are, these talk about rebellion against God. Rebellion in various ways that happened in the Old Testament that is described in the Old Testament. And what Jude is wanting to, to do is he's pulling up these examples and saying, do you see them? Do you see these rebellion, this rebellion or these rebellious people? And then look now, they're, they're exactly the same. Look at the people now and look potentially, or look at the people then in the church that Jude is speaking to, and then look at the people perhaps now and they are painted with the same brush or they are same people, just different names. And so Jude is using Old Testament, we'll look at this in a moment, examples to show the outcome of those who would rebel against God, ultimately. Theolo theologian Douglas Moo states, with regards to these ones, by identifying the false teachers with traditional examples of notorious sinners, he moves his readers to reject these infiltrators and indeed to regard them with horror. They are significant words. Jude is calling us, at this time, to learn from the past, to help us to be equipped to see apostates in the church now. This is why Jude is uh, bringing this to, the, uh, to the, uh, his writer's attention. But I don't want you to see, to, to tr yes, we are to identify apostates, but before you take the sword of the Spirit out, to wield it against every foe there is, Jude's call to us also is to wield the sword of the Spirit to our own heart to say, is there any evil that, they, that I see in them found in my own heart? We need to deal personally with this today, as well as this is a protection for the church now also. Now, leading to our passage, we uh, just bring you up to date. Uh, Jude has provided his greeting in the first two verses. He has then said, look, I wanted to come to you and talk about our common salvation. But he had to redivert because he sees that there are apostates, false teachers in the church. And he said, I want you now to contend for the faith that is once for all given to the saints. For these certain people have come in uh, designated for condemnation and they pervert the grace of God in sensuality that they are, and, and their only master, Jesus Christ. And so now he takes these and now describes these apostates, these false teachers. He's saying, contend for the faith because there are apostates in the church and now he's going to use Old Testament examples to talk about what these ones look like. And we're going to look at how to identify an apostate, but at the same time, we're going to wield the sword of the Spirit on our own heart, as we ought to always do when we come to Scripture. Verse 5, he says, Now I want, you, want to remind you, although you once fully knew it. So he's saying, you, we, in our sinful tendency, we so easily forget the things of the past and how God dealt with them. And he said, I want to remind you of these things. I don't want to forget. Whatever, I, whatever you do, I want you to remember. <clears throat> In fact, I want you to consider these things and then look at your own life and look at uh, the church for the purity of the church. And so um, we're going to look at four things that we need to consider that Jude helps us with. And they are, consider, consider the sin of unbelief. Secondly, consider the sin of autonomy. 
Thirdly, consider the sin of immorality. And then fourthly, consider the sin of arrogance. So let's look at the first one. It says, consider, or consider the sin of unbelief. Look at verse 5, and I'll read the whole part. Now, I want, you to remi- I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed those who did not believe. So Jude, as it were, is bringing up from the grave a multitude of people for you to see and to remind you of an event that happened a long time ago and to say the prediction that or the things that happened to them are the predictions that will happen to these ones in the church now and us if we would go down the same lines. And what is it? You remember the story. Um, God saw the plight of his people under the burden of slavery in, uh, in Egypt. And then he, by his grace and by his love, came with power, a powerful display, by showing miracles and signs, and in the end, let the, um, the Israelites go. And he saved them through the Red Sea. He destroyed the armies of the Egyptians. He led them to Mount Sinai, where he covenanted with them to make them a nation, to give them, a, give them promises. He then leads them through the wilderness, providing water and manna and quail. Uh, he is a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Uh, his glory is shining in the midst of them and surrounded nations are seeing this. And he's leading them to, as we know, the promised land. And in a remarkable statement, though, it says that they rejected this very ministry of Jesus. He alludes to it as being a ministry of Christ, the loving ministry of um, freedom from slavery, taking them to the promised land, provision to be God's people, to be covenanted in God's love, and they rejected that. But what was their sin? Well, it says that it was the sin of unbelief. It was the sin of unbelief. They did not believe and were destroyed. And we remember the story. It's a heart-wrenching story as we look back of their wilderness wanderings toward the promised land. Uh, They are only saved moments from uh, the Red Sea and then within days they are then grumbling against God. Oh, they did not believe in God. They did not believe in the character of God. They did not trust in Him. And time and time again, they showed themselves to be faithless. They said they trusted, but they didn't trust. And therefore, it was sin. While that is true, I think the writer is getting to a particular story where the the unbelief was very paramount or very evident. Well, you remember, 12 spies are sent into the uh, promised land to spy out the land. And then they come back with a report. And the majority report is that we cannot do this. We will be taken over by the people of the land. They're giants in the land. We cannot do this. Even though God has said, now I want you to go. And the minority, Caleb and Joshua, said, surely we can do this. Yeah, while they're giants and we are grasshoppers, but grasshoppers with God will kill giants. And they said, we can do this. And the majority said, we cannot do this. We will not believe in God. In fact, they then turned their backs. They wanted to actually stone Moses. Can you believe that? And turn their backs on the God who saved them. Well, they said they believe in God. They followed God. They certainly turned their back on him. And the result was that God said that this generation, age 20 and above, will be wiped out. They will wander in the wilderness for 40 years and every day they will bury their their loved ones until all of them have been killed except Joshua and Caleb. Jude wants to make it very clear to the church, he is writing to and to us, unbelief is destructive. Unbelief 
is destructive. We, we can have belief in what Christ has done for us. He has saved us. We trust in that. And you probably, tr- I, you, I trust you trust in that. You can believe that he will save us. He has saved us and he will take us to eternity. And we have a, a sense of belief in our heart, confirmed by the Holy Spirit, that we will indeed see Jesus face to face. Oh, but present tense faith is a lot harder. Oh, well, past tense faith, we believe in that our salvation is true, we trust in him, future tense faith, that he will deliver us in the end. But present tense faith, that is where the battle lies. And we must remember that we are called today, this day, in the midst of financial issues, relational issues, job issues, that God is not silent, that he does hear, that he has a plan, that he will take care of us as we move forward as the Egyptian, uh, sorry, the uh, Israelites into the promised land because he is faithful. We've got to be, take hold of this to remember that the apostates do not have faith. They, are unbe- they live in their unbelief, rebellion against God. But we as the children of God are called to trust him and have faith in the midst of difficulties, to believe his providence, to believe his goodness and to trust him. So the first thing we need to consider is to consider the sin of unbelief. Let us not be found falling into that trap. The second thing to consider is consider the sin of autonomy. Consider the sin of autonomy. So the second illustration, the, the uh, Egypt, uh, Israelites are now removed from the scene and in quick fire power, he raises another illustration before our eyes. Now the first illustration and the third illustration are well known. Um, we, we know these, they are, are not obscure, but this one seems a little obscure here, a little unique. What is going on? Let's have a read. Verse 6, and the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. It speaks of angels who left, or sorry, were, were entrusted with authority by God. It says positions of authority. These are heavenly spheres of influence and ministry. These are called proper dwellings. They are given authority with proper dwelling areas, with boundary lines around their uh, authority. But it says that they did not stay within these. They did not stay within the boundaries that God had placed. And ironically now, it says that God now, because they did not stay, God has now kept them You didn't like the boundaries that I gave you. Now I keep you in eternal chains for judgment. Now, this is an interesting story. Uh, What are we to make of this? Who are these angels? Uh, Peter, in a parallel passage, refers to them as well. 2 Peter 2.4. He says, "For For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment... So who are these angels? What, are they? what is this story? Look, there are th- three main views. These are, this is a story about something that's not in Scripture, uh, is the first view, and it's, it's something we don't know about. This, is the, this and Peter's uh, statements there is the first we know about this. That's probably unlikely because these people did know the story. He's saying, remember, I want you to be aware of this. So that's, that's probably unlikely. The second would be, that this is referring to to when Satan and angels fell from heaven, fell away from God. That is in Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28. Now, the only problem with this is that it talks about angels having a judgment of eternal chains. Now, Satan at this moment uh, and his demons are not bound in eternal chains. He will be bound for a thousand years, but he's not bound now. So that's probably unlikely. The most likely is that this refers to the episode in 
Genesis 6, when a number of fallen angels went and cohabitated with actual women on earth in Genesis 6. You can read about that. Um, and the interesting thing, and why, why I believe this is the, the, uh, what he is referring to, for a number of reasons. In Genesis 6, it talks about the sons of God. The sons of God come in and cohabitate in with the uh, children of men, with the, with the women. And the word sons of God actually is, uh, in the Hebrew Bible, uh, four to five times, refers to angels. So that would make sense. Uh, also, angels in the scripture, are referred to as males. They function as males. Um, So that is also unique. Uh, Thirdly, there is, notice in verse 7, it states about the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah, or their sin. It says, likewise, they likewise indulged in sexual immorality. The likewise is referring to what occurred in the verse before it with the angels who, in Genesis 6, indulged in sexual immorality with women. So now you might say, well, hang on a minute. How can angels indulge in sexual immorality with women? Like, surely they don't uh, you know, pro- uh, pro- uh, <laughs> have relations in that way. Um, Matthew twenty-two thirty: For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. So you might say, well, surely the angels in heaven don't marry and are given in marriage. Uh, they can't cohabitate like that. So uh, surely these ones didn't uh, have relationships in that manner. Well, notice that these ones left the boundaries. Yes, indeed, in heaven, they do not cohabitate. Uh, there will be no marriage. There will be no giving in marriage. Uh, but these ones left the boundary lines that they were given in heaven and then fell on earth And it would seem to be, had the ability to cohabitate with these women. And because of such a uh, despicable act of sinfulness, God has put them in eternal chains. Um, That seems to be the main main view. You may have a different view, but that's probably not the main point. So what is Jude telling us to be reminded of with regards to this? Jude here is condemning or an autonomous spirit that seeks to be absolved of the authority of God in our lives. They wanted to be God. These angels who left their boundary lines that God set up, they wanted an autonomous spirit, the very thing that happened to Adam and Eve, and the very thing that is instilled in every human heart a desire for autonomy, a desire to fall outside the authority of God. In fact, the desire to be fall out on any authority that God has placed over us. And see, what defines an apostate is an autonomous spirit, a spirit that seeks to throw off the restraints God has placed over all of us through his word. And while you might not say that you are an apostate, is there any form of autonomy that you are expressing that is seeking go, going outside the boundary lines of God. I've been going through First uh, Peter with my girls through, uh, well, with the family. And wonderful reminder about the authorities God has placed in our lives. And it talks about the authority of government. It talks about the authority of, um, of employees, employers. It talks about the authority in, in the family life. And so oftentimes, those, we, we strain and struggle under the authorities that God has placed in our lives. And we, when we do that, we ultimately forget that God is the ultimate authority and that he has entrusted these authority figures over us. And what does it say that we are to entrust ourselves to the God who judges justly? And Peter uses a wonderful example of Christ there. Do not revile, but uh, do not revile in return, but entrusted himself to the God who judges justly. He is the ultimate one in whom we serve. And we are to fall under the authority of God, not be like these angels who 
fell out of the boundary lines that God had placed over them. We are to consider firstly, consider the sin of unbelief and secondly, consider the sin of autonomy. Don't be like the angels. Thirdly, consider the sin of immorality. The the paint on the pictures is not even dried until he throws another canvas up and starts putting paint on it to show what devastation rebellion brings. This one is the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Look at verse 7. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. You remember the story, I'm sure, back in Genesis 18 to 19. Uh, It's referred to over 20 times in the scriptures. Uh, Lot is in in, in one of the cities, in the city of Sodom, and then the two angels came into the city to see what this is, what Sinfulness is occurring there before God brings destruction upon it. And Lot brings these two angels into his home, fearing that they might uh, fall into the hands of some ungodly men. Well, ungodly men did see them come into the city and did see them go into the house of Lot. And they rapped on the door of Lot's home and said, give us these men that we might know them. Give us these men that we might know them. Sodom and Gomorrah was known... Ezekiel tells us, for its uh, lack of caring for the poor, for its arrogance, for its bigotry, for its pride. But most of all, it was known for its sexual promiscuity, for its immorality. For it says that they indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural flesh. This is different flesh. Uh, This is flesh that is not their own. Now, some commentators have said, well, this must be the flesh of angels. So just as you had the angels cohabitating with women, now you have men seeking to cohabitate with angels. Um, that, 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 is not, that does not seem to be the, uh, the, the focus here because we never get a sense back in the Genesis narrative that the people actually knew they were angels. Lot didn't know they were angels. Now I think the issue here is it's talking about the, the different flesh of the sin of homosexuality. Now, this uh, is a topic that in our day um, is, is something that, that people don't want to talk about. Uh, homosexuality is widely, or well, in fact, is totally and openly accepted. But God has a different view on this. And, and this is the wonderful love proclaimed in his scripture, that while culture changes, While views change, God does not change. He stays the same. And he gives us directions and directives in his scriptures that we might be blessed and that we might be guided into all blessing. And part of that is to say no to certain things and to say yes to certain things. And one of those no's, and it is a big no, is sexual immorality. That is homosexuality. That is all forms of sexual immorality. That is Uh, sex outside the union, covenant union of marriage. Oh, he's given us boundaries there also, and he's given us boundaries uh, for purity. And that is to enjoy sexual intimacy, that it might flourish in the boundaries of marriage. But these ones, in their immorality, sought after their own desires and went after them. And so, What he's saying to us here is that the apostates and all who follow them are are, are, are like the unbelieving generation of Israel that were destroyed, like the rebellious angels uh, who left their boundary lines and then cohabitated and now are in gloomy darkness waiting for judgment and the sexually immoral will be punished with eternal fire. And then verse 8, it says, Yet in like manner, now he turns to these people, yet in like manner, these people also. Uh, Those back in the Old Testament, those ones that we just described are actually those in the New Testament now. Because they're relying upon their dreams, they're not trusting in the word of God. Defile in the flesh, reject authority and blaspheme the glorious ones. That means that uh, 
all believers are given uh, angels serving ministering spirits to look after them. And they reject those as well. The whole lot sounds a lot like uh, those people described in those three illustrations that we had there. They are all the same. They come from the same stump and they'll experience they'll experience the same fate. And the voices of the apostates then and the ones in the Old Testament cry out from the grave and say, do not go there. Do not be foolish. God is the same yesterday, today and forever. He will not change. His judgments will stand forever. And anyone who falls into the habit of unbelief, of autonomy, of immorality, will suffer the same fate. Eternity is long. God is judge and sin must be paid for. And before we go on, if this is a description of you in any form, oh, how wonderful it is that while God does not change and sin must be judged, he did send his own son, Jesus Christ, as a judgment for sin. And does that not display the unchanging nature of God? You say, can't God just forgive me for all the things I've done wrong? No, see, God cannot just forgive you because he's a just God. But God has passed out his judgment on his one and only son, Jesus Christ, who bore the sins of his people in his body on the tree and then now calls all to come to a knowledge of him, to trust in him as their Lord and Savior. And so you, if you fall and you are in the midst of such sins, you can turn to the living God, repent of your sins and come and trust in him. Oh, God is a God of justice, but God is a God of mercy, but that mercy is only found in the salvation of Jesus Christ. That sacrifice, that once and for all sacrifice. Let us now consider lastly, before we go on, consider the sin of arrogance. Consider the sin of arrogance. So offset against these three illustrations is a beautiful example of what we ought to do. And this is the example of the archangel Michael. Have a look at this, verse 9. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Now, the first thing that you might say is, where is that written in the Bible? I've never seen that anywhere. Is that the only place? I can't remember reading about in um, Exodus. Was there anything there? No, no, you haven't read anything because there was nothing written there. I think what Jude is doing here uh, like, is what like Paul did on, uh, the, at the Aragopolis with the Athenians. Uh, he used their philosophers to uh, bring a truth to bear uh, as he witnessed about Christ. What Jude is doing here, he is using... At the same time, apocryphal books that were out, one being the assumption of Moses. And the story seems to be in this book, the assumption of Moses. Does that mean that the book is canonical? Should it be in the canon? Well, no, because not all of it is true. But it doesn't mean that this story is not true. So I think what we've got is an outside source, non-canonical book, called The Assumption of Moses, that was widely spread in that day, for they knew it, for they knew this, um, this story. And he pulls that example, and I would believe that it's most likely probably true, certainly true, uh, because the other ones above are true. Doesn't mean the whole book is true, but this is a truth statement. And he uses this to show what, um, uh, sort of an offset to what not to do, not to be arrogant but to be rather humble. So anyway, what is the story about? It speaks of a struggle with Satan and the Archangel Michael. Now, the Archangel Michael is known as the chief angel, the the great prince, the protector of Israel, Daniel 8, uh, sorry, Daniel 10, Daniel 12. Uh, He will, with other angels, be with Christ as as Christ comes back for his people. Um, The Archangel Michael is not Christ. For Jesus himself said, all authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. 
Um, what we have here is Michael not having authority. He would not presume to pronounce a blasphemous uh, judgment. He does not have this authority. That authority is only granted to God himself, which is Christ. So this is not, um, this is not Jesus. It is the Archangel Michael. And it seems to be that the devil claimed the body of Moses. Uh, we read in Deuteronomy 34 that Moses died and was buried, but no one knows the place where he was laid. And so potentially it would seem that the devil claimed his body, perhaps because Moses had sinned by killing someone and the devil made a claim, you know, that he's a, a, an accuser of the brethren, uh, Job 1, and maybe he made a claim on the body uh, and uh, the archangel Michael was, had buried the body. Uh, maybe... Uh, it's also that he um, believed that he was the prince of the world, that he was the devil on earth, that he had ownership of this. But what seems to be the issue is that Michael was to protect the body, perhaps so that they would not dig it up and venerate it. And so what's the point here? Though Michael is a warrior angel with great authority, great power. He knew the boundary lines of where that power stood and that God had granted him power over Satan, but he did not presume to cast a blasphemous judgment, meaning that he agreed that the devil was evil. He agreed that the devil needed to be judged, but he would not cast the judgment. Therefore, he called out, in a sense, Lord, please re rebuke him, or Lord rebuke you, not I rebuke you. He did not go over the boundary lines. Look at the contrast compared to the humble uh, Archangel Michael who knows his boundary lines to the arrogance of these apostates. But these people, verse 10, blaspheme all that they do not understand and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. There is no restraint. They have given themselves over to the flesh. They are unreasoning animals. They do not even understand. Archangel Michael, great wisdom, understood the boundary lines, understood the authority of God, the judgments of God. These ones boastfully proclaim a self-autonomous nature of arrogance. And Jude provides a loud and clear message to the church then and now that judgment is God's. Let God bring the judgment. Does that mean that people say, well, don't judge for you, you, you'll be judged. No, we are called to judge one another according to the scriptures. Uh, we are called to, if we see our brother failing, to go and bring him up by telling him his sin. We are called to make judgment calls on our own life. But we are not to pronounce judgments over people. We are not to bring judgment upon people. Listen to James here, 4, 11 and 12. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against the brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy, but who are you to judge your neighbor? And James 5, 9, do, uh, do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Romans 12, 18, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. That's not easy. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Oh, we're made to make judgment calls. We're doing that in the church all the time. Uh, but we are called to make them in the right way, in the right means. What do we got here? So we've got four considerations that Jude wants to give to us to identify apostates and to ensure that we do not fall into apostasy. We are to consider the sin of unbelief. We are to consider the sin of autonomy. We are to consider the sin of uh, immorality and consider the sin 
of arrogance. Now, I've provided with you, you as Jude has, these negative things to avoid. Let me just finish with something that we are called to do. And I think this is, this is a good way to round this out. Micah 6, 8. He has told you, O oh man, what is good? And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. The worship of the Lord is not first characterized by outward signs of adoration or even words of pronouncement as they are from a heart attitude of love and humility before God and others. This is the fruit of salvation. This is the fruit of the sins purchase and pardon. This is the work of the Spirit in our lives. The fruit is love of right and a hatred for evil. It is to love kindness or, or show mercy just as God has done to you and to take every opportunity to express it. This is a call to walk humbly before God and others, to understand the boundary lines that, that are set in place in my life. Close walk with God will be an all-encompassing walk. Every fiber of your body, every attitude that you have, every action, every word is called to fall into conformity with the nature of Christ. May the Lord give you this day a fresh zeal for the things that he loves. And may your thoughts and attitudes and may mine be of the purest nature. And may you give into any temptation to walk according to the flesh. And may the Lord give you grace to identify that which is wrong and to walk in all that is good for the glory of his great name. Let us pray. Our unchanging, almighty God, you are from everlasting and you do not change. Lord, you have pronounced judgment, curses and blessings and you will bring them to fruition. Lord, you have given your people a guidance in which to walk. You've granted the spirit to help us in that process. You have called us in conformity with the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that you would ch protect the church as Jude uh, calls for from apostates. I pray that you would protect the church from uh, evil actions and evil doing. Lord, help all of us to walk in unity in the bond of peace. Help us to walk in the spirit of Christ. For your glory we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.